Amen. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for stirring up our hearts, for causing our attention to be focused on that which matters, for emphasizing to us what is needful once again. We thank you for delivering us from the insensitivity that duplicity of activities normally bring on our hearts. And we ask that you help us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Please, you may be seated. Uh, thank you again, sir, for the privilege and uh, the encouragement that you have brought to we, the younger ministers. And I want to recognize the presence of someone I consider a mentor, Dr. Shola from London. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter one. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah of the priests that were in Anatot in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of, his, of, of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. I chose this scripture because I had a discussion with God early this morning. If you check the scripture that we just read, you will realize that the word of the Lord came to the prophet in two distinct seasons. The first season that he received words from God was a season of revival where everything was going well. The hand of God was on the nation. Great things were happening. They were fulfilling prophecy. They were, they, they were in step with the agenda of God. And the second season that he received the word of the Lord was the season of transition. When Israel had broken the covenant of alignment and because of that, the judgment of God has set in and was occasioned and the political structures that had to come into place in order for that which God has ordained by reason of the disalignment to begin to take place. And this man had prophetic words that covered the season of transition. So the first object of the discussion I had with the Lord is that he said we are in a season of transition. Now, are you with me? I'm just trying to before I raise maybe one scripture, I want to um, discuss the discussion I had with God. He said we are in a season of transition. And he said one of the reasons why he allows transition to take place is so that he can sift the body of Christ. There are several ministers that have confidence in their methods, confidence in their strategies, and they are living off their great ideas. And, and so God needs to occasion a transition. And in a season of transition, it becomes obvious who is rooted in God or who is rooted in his strategy. Now, in a season of transition, God begins to um, occasion a shift so that he can bring a different emphasis from the emphasis that had flourished for a season. And people that are hooked onto God 
are carried along in the grace that occasions and establishes a new emphasis in the body of Christ. Anyone that is not tied to God as his principal strategy is left out of the arrangement that finds expression when there is a transition. A transition brings about the uh, unveiling of, a, of new sets of leaders in the body of Christ. It brings about uh, the manifestation of new voices. It also uh, validates the labors of people that have been laboring accurately and it pedestals them in uh, platforms of uh, stronger coverage in the body of Christ. A lot of sifting and shifting is going to take place. It's going, it's going on right now and many people have lost the cutting edge of their ministries and that horn through which they were designed to perpetually have capacity through the mercy of God to minister to the body of Christ. So he began to speak about transition. Now, when the discussion became deeper, he brought up some issues that I would like to highlight briefly. Um, amen. He says, he says, most of our ministers are in a performance mode. It's just like if you have been to, okay, this is Lagos, so a soap factory. Uh, hallelujah. And then uh, some of our factories are automated and there are machines that do some of the things that uh, humans used to do before. So when the production line is giving up soap and then the machine that picks soap and drops soap, soap drops soap, and soap, the machine is do it like this. That's performance. We are used to performance. It's like, let's get it rolling. Let's, this is what we do. So he spoke about a performance mode. Now, a performance mode is what happens, what we become when we are used to activity and we do not know that ministry has to do with our intercourse with God. The, the place and the ministry of the inner chamber is no longer an emphasis in many quarters, but there is a very rigid performance mode that is in place. So he spoke about that so much uh, this morning. Then uh, he also said uh, that many ministers in Nigeria are distracted and uh, the COVID gap facilitated for that distraction. Um, there were many activities that were stopgap measures because are you with me? If there's someone watching me now and you're in Lagos, the best place for you to be is to be physically present in the meeting. The online possibility is a compromise just for very peculiar situations. And if you are in Lagos, you are supposed to be sitting here in this conference. Hallelujah. Just in case you had it in mind to participate in the conference, you are supposed to be physically present. Now, so we had the online window during the COVID, and a lot of online ministry has begun, which is not the original strategy that God intended to reach the body of Christ with. Many things evolved, which were not part of the original script, but a stopgap compromise that had to be made so that ministry can continue going. For some now, that compromise is the ministry now. For instance, if you are going to raise men to know how to pray, you are going to pray with them. You are going to pray with them until, like when I got married, I afflicted my wife with prayer. 
then I don't know if we'll have, if the future of Christianity in Nigeria is secure. And mainly, a lot of compromise has been admitted into our processes. And God for us to serve God and mammon. And in that discourse, Jesus referred to mammon as a man who God's position. In the life and in the heart of a man that already understands that many people have adopted strategies. Then finally he said the issue of morality has been trivialized. So in view of the above, because I asked, okay, now, how do we, what's the way forward? Uh, we have a problem. What's the way forward? The word he mentioned to me is consecration. Genesis chapter 12. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like us to follow briefly. Um, there is a sign he gave me, and I'm, I'm hoping for it. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. The word that I'd like you to see in this scripture is had, that it means that God had been encountering Abraham and the voice of the Lord was locked up in his head. It, it's, it's, it's necessary for us to understand Abraham's background. Abraham's family was a family that was given to the priesthood in the land of all the Chaldees. So, these guys are people that are familiar with communication from the spirit realm. And now there was this voice that was locked up in his head, giving him instructions. Now, it, it was different from the other voices he's been hearing. The first thing he did was that he submitted that voice to his father. How do I know this? You know, I said that the power word there is had. The Lord had said unto Abram. Can you turn to verse 11, chapter 11? In chapter 11, you will see there is sufficient evidence to prove that Abraham submitted the voice he was hearing to his father, and this was the outcome. Verse 27 of Genesis chapter 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. Next verse. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in all of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took, I would like you to see the traveling party. Terah took. Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth, and went forth with them from all of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. If you check verse 31, you will see that the one that constituted the travel party was not the one that was called the one that was constituting the travel party was Terah, the father of Abraham. Now, so what happened was that Abraham submitted the voice that he was hearing to his father. And obviously, his father felt he was crazy. But since the guy 
will not allow his father rest. So his father said, all right, let's make, make some moves. And it was terror that was responsible for the traveling. It was terror that constituted the travel party. Meanwhile, there was a prescribed pattern in the demands that God was making on Abraham. Is they get thee out of thy country, get thee out of thy kindred, get thee out of thy father's house. Now, the implication of that is that Abraham should go to um, uh, immigration service and ask them to expunge his name from the lexicon of people that are captured as nationals of the country. He should visit their clan meeting and demand the eldest person in the clan to read out the list of families and the members of families. And when they get to his turn, he said, stop, delete my name from that arrangement. Now, those of you that, I don't want to go somewhere. Do you? Mm. <laughs> from where I come from, if you attempt that, that's, you have announced to all the witches that you are an object of attack. I, I, will, I speak in parables. Now, so, and then for him to visit his father and ask his father to consider him dead. So he will be countryless, clanless, and fatherless at the end of that arrangement. That was the level of compliance that God was demanding from him. He submitted it to his father. His father did not take into inventory all the dynamics and the depth of what God was asking him to do. Now, are you still with me? Now, I came to this scripture deliberately because many, many of our calls are, are being managed by terror. And guess what? Terror behaved as if he wanted to actually go to the place that, that uh, it was his intention to arrive that place because it, he agreed, they agreed that it was the Canaan that they were going to. And then he now moved and came to Haran and dwelt there. Now, theologians and scholars said that Abraham received that call in his head at the age of 20. He spent five years at trying to get himself to agree with it. So that's 25. And then he submitted the calling to Terah and Terah now moved them to Haran and Haran means delay and they were in Haran for 50 years. The first question the Lord said I should ask is how long will you, I'm talking to somebody, how long will you remain in Haran? I'm seeing someone that is in this congregation. God began to move with you on campus, move mightily with you on campus, in the prophetic and also in the power gifts and uh, because you performed excellently in your undergraduate education, you, you, got, you got opportunities, opportunities that have constituted haram in your life. And God is calling you back to the place that you left in the name of Jesus Christ. Now listen, when they arrived at Haran, God had to kill their father in order to release Abraham to continue with his agenda. Are you still with me? So that's why in Genesis chapter 12, the past tense was used. The Lord had said unto Abraham. Now, are you still with me? Okay. So in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse number 4, Abraham now had the opportunity to constitute the party that will be traveling. And because of the error of his father, his father had already taken lot. It was no longer politically correct for him to send lot away. So he wanted to be a good man. So he accommodated issues into that calling that did not exist there originally. I know you know you are men of scripture. You know that that was an opening to satanic invasion uh, on his call 
on his mission subsequently, that lot he admitted started growing. And the growth of lot was that the growth of lot was inversely proportional to his own growth. It was going to stand against his possibility of becoming everything that God had said. But you see, he wants to be politically correct. There's another person in this place that is trying to manage somebody. In fact, the Lord said to, for 12 years, someone that God has not called to walk alongside you, and you've been trying to be political and you've compromised, you are not even in good standing with God anymore because of your willingness to keep that system running. Uh, I pray that you find enough courage, enough masculinity to, to make a clean break in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. Abraham reconstituted the travel party wrongly. And um, in the book of Genesis chapter number 12, verse 6, we now saw the sat nav. It's, it's the pathway of navigation that he was led by God to walk in. I hope you know are you there? This place that Abraham was going to, he, there was no map. There was no destination. The only assurance God gave him was that, I will show you. That means every dream Abraham had was significant. It was a part of the map. Every open vision he had. Every word of knowledge that came every whisper that came, every impression that came. Do you realize how dependent Abraham needs to be to God in order for him to arrive at the destination? Yes, now, under the circumstances that Abraham is in now, he can't quarrel with God because if he does, God will leave him in the desert. Is that how you depend on God? I'm just trying to... Before we enter into... I'm showing you clues that it is possible for you to become so strong in what you are doing, as if you know it all. If that has happened to you, you stop ministry long ago. Because the way God does it in ministry, he doesn't give you everything at the same time. He gives you in piecemeal so that you can depend on him. At any point in time where your dependence quotient is questionable, you are in the service to yourself, not in the service of God. It would have been easier for God to say, okay, this is where you are going. This is the map. See you there. But God decided that I want to develop a system in the life of my, in my dealings with this man that this man will be perpetually dependent on me. So at least you know you are going somewhere. But there's no map. There's no map. I remember... In final year, I, I had this roommate who were both preachers. I was the teacher of my campus, but he was the preacher. He can, he can set this place up, please. So we, we now became roommates. I was expecting that that will produce a revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, we had some interesting times. The first, when we just became roommates, he, he arrived the room before I came, and then he said, I hope you know that I'm your senior in ministry. I say, yes, sir. So sit down and shut up. I want to teach you ministry. That's why we're in this room. I said, I like it. <laughs> he went to the cupboard and he brought a sack. I was very attentive. He brought a sack and dropped it. And he said, you know the content of this sack? He said, messages. That he has already prepared messages for one year. And if he wants to preach, he'll just speak one and pray in tongues and go and preach. That was the first training he was giving me for ministry. Meanwhile, God will not. Are you with me? You know, I came with my diary. I have messages prepared there. And as I prayed early this morning, none of them qualified for what I'm doing now. My greatest, my greatest inability is to know what God is saying. It's not as if we don't study the Bible enough to be able to talk. 
there, there is what to seek in terms of content. Ah, that's not the problem. The problem is what is God saying? Well, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Um, maybe for you, you have a sack like my friend. And he had a sack. That's not how God leads his people. Meanwhile, your study life is so that you can improve on your relationship with God and be more accurate. Your message or anything God will ask you to do, any errand he will send you to perform, will come out of your relationship with him. Are you still with me? Now, so Abraham did not, could not by any means exercise the luxury of quarreling with God because the mission he was on had already rigged him out of independence. It was a journey of utter dependence on God. Now, this is where people miss it. At any point in time when you become so confident in your strategy, you lose that link with the real sat nav that is navigating you to the place where you will find your inheritance. Uh, and then you get stuck and, uh, and a transition will reveal you for who you are. So once and again, God occasions transitions in the spirit where he might start counting at a frequency, one, two, three, then he, he jumps to 14. He doesn't continue at that same frequency. He, he jumps and continues somewhere else so that people that are stuck in their ways, that have mastery in their methods, will freeze at this. At, watch what I'm saying. In the next five years, you will be able to identify ministries in Lagos that are frozen because of the transition that God has orchestrated at this time. Are you still with me? All right. So, like I said, there is a sat nav. The sat nav is uh, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. The Bible says, Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim. Can we still agree? Can we still agree that the movements of Abraham were ordained by God? He was not passing that route because it was a resultant route. He was going through that route because that was how God led him. Are you still there? These, these are prophetic navigations. Uh, these, are, these are orchestrations for sons to navigate through pathways in the spirit in search of their inheritance. And every one of us has this life. We have this kind of system, this kind of arrangement that is built around our lives. Now, he passed through Sikkim onto the plain of Moreh. So if you click on your lexicon, you'll find that Sikkim is the back of the shoulder, here. If you click on Moreh, you will see that Moreh means a teacher. Meanwhile, in ancient Jewish custom, it is at the back of the shoulder that people carry luggage, not on the head, like us, here. So if you see this, this sat nav, what it is saying is that, are you there? Back of the shoulder, that's where we carry burdens. And more means teacher. It means for a man that is navigating with God, your teaching, the education that God will be bringing to you will be consistent with the burden that you are bearing. If you are not bearing God's burdens, you are not receiving God's lessons. Are you still with me? He said, come unto me all ye that labor and that heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon me and learn. It is when you have taken the yoke that you learn of him. There is a learning that is yoke-based. You are not with me? Doctor, I was following your message when you said uh, you were born in Ikoyi. And the moment you gave your life to Christ and you started following God, a yoke. That's how God trains you into your calling. 
Because a man from Ikoyi is not likely to become a deliverance minister. He's supposed to be a technocrat. <laughs> if we allow him to grow the way the context has already chosen for him, he should not be talking about demons today. I miss only the session from when we started coming to this place. That's how he became a deliverance minister. Indeed, everybody here is supposed to be a deliverance minister. Because while they were speaking, I was still in that conversation. So I felt I had to break to receive what was happening in the conference this morning so that I will see where I'm missing it. And you were preaching. And uh, not trying to look like a deliverance minister. I said, there are other things with the word of God, though. You know, it's very diplomatic, very matured. <laughs> well, maybe you will not believe this, but let me say it. Let me say it. You will not believe it. The impression that came to me when you were preaching was that we all need to become deliverance ministers in this season. That's the impression that came to me. There is a yoke that God will allow to rest on you. That yoke will, will, will force you into the things that God wants to teach you. You will need to pass through Sikkim so that you can receive the lecture that is in More. Many of you absconded from the, the revelatory insight that develops your pathway. You absconded and you went for window shopping. You got some ideas here, got some ideas there. Meanwhile, don't get me wrong, the Lord can actually place a pattern before your face and ask you to copy and paste. He has, he has told that, he has done that with me before. But I'm talking about people looking for ideas and they go shopping. It's okay. This is the model in the covenant nation. And then gather strategies and say, now we are ready for ministry. Now, What you have done to yourself is that you have, you have excluded yourself from the way God educates a man that he has called to labor for him. He, he allows you to bear a body. You will, not design, you will not determine your shape. God, through the bodies he makes available to you, will determine your outcome, your shape. If you are so practically involved in determining your style, your model, your concept, your shape, <laughs> You are into public speaking. You are not into ministry. And we need to take time to, to unveil the demarcation. The demarcation between ministry, real ministry, public speaking, and somebody that is just excited. Because the path that God leads you into is going to shape the eventual outcome of your service delivery. My own battles began from the womb. So he crafted me to be a deliverance minister like yourself. <laughs> we practical with impossible situations that only the power of God can solve. So that is how I became acquainted with power. That's when I knew the need for power because the burden he put on my shoulder opened me up to a a different set of skills, spiritual skills. Now, the question is, do you have spiritual skills that you can call on now and it will answer to you? If, if the answer is no, you avoided the sat now. So you are without true identity in the spirit. You are saying something, but demons are not concerned about what you are doing. The other time I was in Manchester, Etihad Stadium was filled to capacity and it was not Jesus that gathered the people. So you can actually gather a crowd and Jesus is not in the center. There are skills, there are ways to do it. There are psychological approaches to it. But we are not psychologists. We are servants of Jesus Christ. There is a cutting edge that Jesus will give you which is based on education. And this education is a function of the weight that God places on 
your life. A word is enough for the wise. Verse 7, which is my emphasis, that's where I've been going all along. And the Lord appeared to, unto Abraham. Please give me the scripture on the screen. Verse. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And he built there an altar. It means that Abraham was brought into the knowledge of the fact that his actions were going to lay the foundation for a generation that he could not see, that God was seeing. Could it be that some of the strategic moves you have taken has already obscured, brought blindness, darkness, on a generation that God programmed to inherit the virtue of your labor? Could it be? In your bid to be contemporary, in your bid to prove to the world that you are not failing, you had to take some drastic decisions that affected your operations and compromising the complete stock of education that God had designed for you. And you were able to do this because you were blind to the fact that you were laying a foundation for generations to come. Now, let's imagine. Okay, no need to imagine. I'm almost out of time. Hallelujah. When God spoke this to him, the Bible says, then he builded and he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. That's the altar of consecration. There are three scriptures in the entire Bible that speak about the subject of consecration. Leviticus chapter 8, Romans chapter 6, and Romans chapter 12. Now listen to me. Are you still there? Let's use this nine minutes well. Then he builded an altar. You see, this was the beginning of altars in the life of Abraham. And for Abraham, he, he built altars and pitched tents. So the altars were permanent and the tents that he built were temporary. So if you come into the territory where you could see Abraham's missionary journey by his altars. And the first altar that Abraham built was that every altar has a significance. Every altar that Abraham built has a significance. Uh, the first one he built was the altar of consecration. He now devoted himself completely to the God that appeared to him. He knew other gods before. This was the moment of total committal to God. Now, if we go to the book of Romans chapter 12, because the object of consecration in the book of Romans chapter 12 is to give us sufficient discernment to be able to know the will of God. The object of consecration in the book of Romans chapter 6 is to bring us to a point where we begin our walk of holiness. So the object of consecration in Romans 6 is our walk of holiness. The object of consecration in Romans chapter 12 is to be brought in the schools of God so that our hearts can discern the will of God and latch onto it. Now, are you still with me? Now, consecration has a commercial side and a committal side. We are consecrating to God because we understand that he paid for us and we are his property. Payment was made in blood. I remember when I was given the list to go and provide in order to marry my wife. My wife is from the West, so I don't know the ways of the West, but I know her. So I was given a very long list, and it was in Yoruba language. The first need I had was for an interpreter, because... <laughs> now, all of that was, was not necessary until I wanted the, to begin the process of taking a wife. Then there was an obligation that I had to meet. So when we went for, to the interpreter, and the person interpreted, interpreted, and then there's one fish, one particular fish, that they said I should go and look for. 
and that fish is not in the state where I'm coming from. So the question was, where will I locate this species of fish? And thank God my mom spent some time of her growing up in Ilori and gave me some insight on how to find that fish. Now, when we brought the things that we were requested to bring, it was a heap. A mighty heap. I saw some women passing by and they were saying, ah, hey, if God can help for someone to marry their daughter like this. Now the point, it was when I finished all of that ceremony and we got married that I discovered that there's something I didn't pay for. I didn't pay for her love. She would decide whether to give me or not. Now according to this scripture, he is saying that we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. If by any means we are not willing to do that, it means we are not reasonable. We have not considered the, 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 the price that was paid to secure the bride price. So if my wife didn't give me her love for free, haven't paid that price, it means she has not considered the price that was paid. You realize that this offering that God is asking us to, to offer, meanwhile, this is the symbol of the burnt offering in the New Testament. This offering is asking us to offer is with an understanding of the fact that you no longer have property rights. You've been bought. And the only reasonable thing you can do is the love that God had for you, that occasion you are being bought. If you have become reasonable, then you need to reciprocate that gesture by what? Consecration. It means that any believer, indeed minister, that has not come to the realization of he, the need for consecration as a proof that is reasonable. In consecration, you lose your rights. So there are two aspects. The commercial side is there's payment, you know that, and then the committal side is that you acknowledge the payment and you willingly give yourself to serve the will of God. God, even though he has paid, will not force you to, to, to commit. You will never do that. You will never say, you know you are my property. No. He will never do that. So coming to that realization, the Bible says that you are reasonable. And the Lord says that the cure for all the variables that will manifest during this time of transition, the cure for it is a commitment, a complete commitment to him. To do his will, not what you think is right. To make him proud, not, not, not to succeed, This is the object of the discussion I had with God this morning, and he, I don't think he was in a very good mood as we discussed the issues of we, his servants, and where he wants to take us into as a city of light, as a people that he can possess in order to do his will upon the face of the earth. A complete committer. That was where Abraham's journey started when he came to that point of complete commitment. I am yours. That's what he said. You are the master. That's what he said. From that day, it will be illegal for Abraham to run things without God's involvement. From that day, Abraham is sentenced to inquire of the Lord before he takes any move. From that day, Abraham realized it was no longer how smart he was that mattered. It was how yielded and how obedient. You see, the parameters change. The moment you find a man that commits to the Lord this way. There is this statement that Watchman Nee normally makes. He says that there is a difference between a normal sinner and a forgiving sinner. Is that true? All right. He also said that there is a difference between a normal believer and a consecrated believer. 
the parameters change. It's not about, it's about, the parameters are in the form of yieldedness, in the form of obedience. The parameters are in the form of seeking the face of God and inquiry. The parameters are in the form of alignment so that you become a body that God possesses. It is not your will that is playing out. It is God's will that is playing out through your vessel. So that it is impossible to separate you from the will of God. That was how Moses became. When Moses became angry and he used his rod to hit the rock, the people did not know if it was God that was angry or it was Moses that was angry. That was why God had to come eventually to judge. I wasn't the one. So Moses, you will not, you will not end. Can you be so one with God's will? Can we pray? No, it's not prayer in tongues, though. It's meditative. So that you can have that space and the convenience to be isolated from the person that is sitting by your side. And say, I bow to you, Master. Can you tell him that?